Born in February 1970, 16-year-old Kevin Hicks lived in Croydon, South London with his dad Derek, mum Terry and 15-year-old sister Alexandra. Kevin and Alexandra shared a close bond, the pair being part of the same wider friendship group and attending the same local school, the now closed John Ruskin High. Kevin was a typical teenage boy of the 1980s. He loved music, including bands such as Madness, Survivor, Japan and Yazoo, and was a supporter of his hometown football club, Crystal Palace. Described as a happy teenager, Kevin was not involved in a gang, was not known to abuse drugs, had never had any run-ins with the law, and was not believed to be experiencing any issues at school or in his personal life. He was even known to have been looking for work in the weeks before his disappearance. All of this would make Kevin's sudden vanishing on Sunday the 2nd of March 1986 all the more perplexing. Kevin spent the morning and part of the afternoon of the day of his vanishing racing his remote control cars around a local park with the family dog. The Hicks would enjoy what they didn't know at the time was their final family meal together later that afternoon. After losing the argument with his younger sister, Kevin joined his dad in washing the dishes. Derek Hicks left the family home in the early evening after receiving an emergency call from work. Just before 8.40pm, Kevin suddenly remembered that he had an O-level home economics exam at school the next day and, after checking the fridge, realised that he needed eggs. Kevin took just one pound from his mum and told her that he was heading to the shop. He didn't take his wallet, his keys or his trusty bicycle. Dressed in a red, white and black Lacoste bomber jacket, blue jeans and white high-tech training boots, Kevin left his home in the dark and began the 350-yard journey from his home in Sissinghurst Road to Sparrings Community Shop on Lower Addiscombe Road. Terry Hicks would later report that her son was in a good mood at the time and that there was nothing about his demeanour or behaviour that gave her cause for concern. This is the last time she would see her son. Sperring's community shop was visible from Kevin's bedroom window. Terry Hicks knew that if her son was just going to the shop and returning straight home, he'd be no longer than 10 minutes. 10 minutes passed by, then 30 minutes, then an hour. Her sense of unease growing, Terry told herself that her son must have run into a friend. Another hour passed by and Terry ushered her young daughter up to bed. Alexandra Hicks strained to listen to the sound of her mum calling around to Kevin's friends on the home telephone. One by one, each of Kevin's friends confirming that Kevin wasn't with them and that they hadn't seen him either. Just before midnight, Derek Hicks returned home from work. After being told that his son hadn't come home and wasn't at the homes of any of his friends, Derek called the police and suggested that his wife call round to local hospitals. Kevin wasn't at any of the local hospitals, and the police informed the family that they would have to call back 24 hours after Kevin had been missing before an officer would respond. The family searched the local area but found no trace of Kevin. Evening turned to morning and Kevin still hadn't returned. Terry Hicks had spent the night staring out the window expecting at any moment for her son to walk down the garden path. An anxious Alexandra went to school the next day, not knowing where her brother was. When police finally did respond, the focus of their initial inquiries was on the Hicks family. Alexandra was taken out of school and intensively questioned by police, who said to her, quote, You know where your brother is. Why don't you save us the aggro and just tell us? Years later, Alexandra would recount the trauma of those first few days and weeks of her brother's vanishing and the intensity of the police questioning. As Kevin's case is more than 30 years old, and as it receives so little media coverage, few details are available about the specifics of the police search or what action was taken locally to raise awareness of his disappearance. It was however established that the last known sighting of Kevin was at 10pm in nearby Shirley Road. This places him approximately half a mile from home around an hour and 20 minutes after leaving for the shop. Kevin was said to be heading in the general direction home at this time, though no information is available on exactly who reported this sighting. 
it's also not known how Kevin was behaving at this time. Unfortunately, police were unable to ascertain if Kevin had actually even arrived at Sperring Community Shop. Though the store had CCTV, there wasn't a tape in the VHS at the time, and when questioned, staff didn't remember seeing Kevin that evening. This raises many questions. Where was Kevin during this 80 minute window of time? Did he in fact make it to the shop? And if not, why not? Had this supposed trip to the shop been a ruse? Was Kevin actually headed elsewhere? And if so, why did he feel the need to hide this from his mother? Did he intend to meet someone? And if so, who? Was he headed to the shop, but then diverted away by events unknown? What became of Kevin immediately after his final sighting? And how did he not make it the short distance home? Was Kevin actually heading somewhere other than home when sighted at 10 p.m.? Sadly, with no leads, no sightings and no evidence, Kevin's case very quickly turned cold. Life for the Hicks family was never the same again, particularly in the immediate aftermath of Kevin's vanishing. Each time the phone rang or the postman visited, there was a moment of anticipation, of hope, followed by disappointment. The first Christmas without Kevin was spent at the Hicks household. Terry Hicks wanted to be there in the event that her son made it home. For Alexandra Hicks, her parents became increasingly protective and, quote, wrapped her in bubble wrap. Around seven to eight months into the search for Kevin, the Hicks began receiving strange phone calls. Their home phone would ring, but when answered, the caller didn't speak. Terry would even begin to receive the calls at her place of work. She worked part-time, and the calls would only be received on the days that she was present. Presumably, the calls stopped at some unknown point. They were never traced, and it remains unknown if these calls were related in any way to Kevin's vanishing, or if they were perhaps simply a cruel prank. Leads in Kevin's case were few and far between. One of the few leads to emerge was a boy working in a local hairdresser's who was found to so closely resemble Kevin that police asked the boy's parents for evidence that he was their child. Terry Higgs searched for her son right up until the end of her life in October 1994. She gave a final impassioned appeal for information just a week before her death. Sadly, both of Kevin's parents would die not knowing their son's fate as, in May of 2003, Derek Hicks would also pass away. The Hicks family home was eventually sold, but the new residents were asked to keep an eye out for Kevin. Following the death of her grandmother, Alexandra became the only remaining relative still searching for Kevin. It wasn't until 2016, 30 years after Kevin's vanishing, that a major new update in the case would be revealed. In December of 2016, Detective Inspector John McQuaid of Metropolitan Police disclosed to the media and Kevin's family that the status of his case had been changed from a missing persons investigation to probable murder. He revealed that police now believe that Kevin was probably assaulted and murdered on the night of his vanishing and his body disposed of. Detective McQuaid said, quote, Many inquiries have been carried out over the years, but Kevin's body has never been found, and there is no evidence that he is still alive. We believe Kevin must have met someone that night, been assaulted, and his body disposed of. We believe Kevin must have met someone in that hour and a half, and that that person attacked him. Perhaps the suspect didn't mean to kill him, but it is clear Kevin's body must have been disposed of. I truly believe people in the local Croydon community hold the answers to what happened to Kevin. The detective inspector also stated that a search of Kevin's belongings after his disappearance revealed that he'd been attempting to hide a pair of stereo speakers that his parents hadn't bought for him and that Kevin couldn't have afforded to buy for himself. Detective McQuaid added, quote, we now feel that those speakers were, if you like, an inducement around the grooming aspect of it. It's classic grooming. We didn't really call it that back then, but there is definitely an element of that to Kevin's disappearance, we think. The final revelation was that on October 25th, 1996, 10 years after Kevin's vanishing, an anonymous voicemail message was received 
by local newspaper, the Croydon Advertiser, in which the caller claimed that Kevin was dead and that they knew where he was buried. It's believed that police searched the alleged and undisclosed burial site, but that nothing was found. The call was untraceable and the caller has never come forward or been identified. Detective McQuaid appealed for the mysterious caller to reach out to police. A £20,000 reward was also offered for information leading to the discovery of what had happened to Kevin. Five years later, no leads are forthcoming and nothing was garnered from this renewed appeal. There is much speculation online about what may have become of Kevin. One theory is that he simply ran away for his own reasons. Of course, Kevin took nothing with him. No cash, no clothing. He had no transport and no ID and he hasn't been sighted once in over 35 years. Police seem to strongly suspect that Kevin was the victim of grooming, though exactly what form this suspected grooming took is unknown. Was the potential groomer's motive sexual? Were they grooming him for criminal activities? Groomers are known to often induce their victims with offers of gifts. Were the speakers that Kevin was hiding perhaps a gift from a groomer? Did the groomer then lure him to a meeting spot? Kevin vanished two and a half years before another London teenager, Lee Boxall, who disappeared without a trace five miles away in Sutton in 1988. Lee has also never been found and not a single trace of him uncovered. Could Kevin and Lee's vanishings be linked? The Metropolitan Police don't think so. Could Kevin have found himself involved in criminal activity? Could he have seen something he shouldn't have or perhaps gotten on the wrong side of a dangerous person? If Kevin was in fact murdered, then could it have simply been a random attack or an accident? A case of wrong place, wrong time? Could he have been murdered by someone he knew who hadn't been grooming him, either intentionally or by mistake, and his body then hidden? Could Kevin have been in a secret relationship? It's important to stress that all of this is simply speculation, as not a single trace of Kevin has ever been found. The answers in this case lie in where Kevin was between 8.40pm and just after 10pm on the night of his vanishing and what his true motives were for leaving his home that night. Alexandra Hicks has kept her brother's favourite cassette tapes and his 1980s Crystal Palace scarf. She eventually moved away from Croydon to nearby Sutton. Her house is dotted with photos and the belongings of her brother. Now a grandmother, she remains committed to finding her elder brother. She regularly speaks to the press and maintains a Facebook page dedicated to sharing Kevin's story. Alexandra will not believe that her brother is dead until she has his body. In her most hopeful moments, she imagines that her brother ran away to pursue his interest in cooking, perhaps in the army or the navy. She recently revealed to the media that Kevin's case is not a live investigation and that she hadn't heard from the police in five years. Her repeated requests for her brother's police case file have been rejected each time on the grounds of confidentiality. Speaking to the media outlet My London in March of 2021, Alexandra said of her brother's case, Somebody out there has got this secret. It's a long time to keep this secret away from a family that has a missing relative. I've lost a lot of family members. They've died not knowing what happened to their son, their grandson, and I don't think it's fair. I won't give up. I need an answer, one way or another. 16-year-old Kevin Hicks was last seen at 10pm on Sunday, March 2nd, 1986, on Shirley Road, Croydon, South London. He was wearing a red, white and black Lacoste bomber jacket, blue jeans and white high-tech training boots. He's described as white, with light brown hair, standing at 5 feet 10 inches tall. Kevin's right eye is blue and his left eye hazel. On the screen now is an age-progressed image of what Kevin may have looked like at 33 years old. You may have seen Kevin in the vicinity of Sissinghurst Road, Black Horse Lane or Lower Addiscombe Road at around 8.40pm. If alive today, he would be 51 years old. If you have any information relating to Kevin's disappearance, please contact Missing People. You can do so confidentially on 116 0 or call the police non-emergency line by dialing 101.